How is it that this one simple trick of going with the acid flow can find us so many bugs? I don't know, it just seems super good and useful, doesn't it? All right, so this is a relatively simple vulnerability, but it does require a little bit of mental juggling to keep track of what's going on in the setter versus the getter. So let's go ahead and see this uh, user space arg being passed in. We see a copy from user being called. It's copying in size of length data from that buffer. And so that's just gonna be filling in length, which is a 64-bit unsigned value. It's gonna do a sanity check against some maximum size, which we'll come back to if it seems like that's gonna be interesting. Then we see a lock. Well, that's mutual exclusion, one of our words of power. So there must be some sort of shared resource in play right here. So what's the resource? Well, if you read the code, uh, you would see that it's this context, CTX. That is a global, that's a global in the context of this uh, kernel driver execution. And it's a data structure that has this kind of stuff tables and memory sizes what's a table i don't know some lengths and entries and so forth so context is a global structure and because it's the kernel and because there's opportunities for parallelism it needs to put locks around that anytime it's accessing that context so that it can't be erased between different things so this seems fine so far it's locking the context and it's uh, setting some table length to the size of some other structure we look at that this structure has a length, it has 600 entries where each entry is essentially a 32-bit value. We can see it's using that bitwise notation, that colon right there is for saying 31 of those bits are used for offset and one bit is used for valid. And then I would also point out that it's using a empty array and usually you'll see this written like this, but they've put the zero in there and so that's to indicate that somewhere after this, basically it's to use this data as a pointer to after th all of these entries, then if you want a pointer there, then there's gonna be some data filled in after all those entries. So that's a somewhat common paradigm to have these sort of empty arrays. So essentially it's like they're not pre-reserving a sp amount of space for the data and therefore uh, it's just gonna have to be specified typically with something like the length which will tell you how much data is after these hard-coded entries. All right, anyways, table length gets filled in, num entries gets filled in, and the spin lock is unlocked. Then it's got a calculation of the attacker-controlled length that came in, plus this hard-coded table length. That's gonna be the mem size. It's gonna throw that into a malloc to get a user table, and then it zeroes the user table. That's good, no OODA vulnerabilities right here because they initialized everything. Okay, then it takes that calculated size, the hard-coded size plus the attacker-controlled size, and copies that into the user table that it just allocated. Now we see another lock, and that means it must be accessing something like context, which is uh, requires mutual exclusion. So now it's accessing context user table, and so it's taking whatever is there, sticking in something called temp, taking the user table that it just allocated and memset and copied from user space, putting that into the context user table. So the global has been updated, and then the temp is set to the local variable, and then it does the mem size into the context and the entry num into the context. Now, this is where the actual problem's gonna occur. You know, I could just read through the rest of the code with you, but the expectation is you read the code already. So th this is where the problem occurs, because if it goes down this control flow path, it's ultimately going to call free on this user table. Now the user table is the old value that was in the global context. So the global context has been successfully updated, but the issue is that the way, if we hadn't done that free right here, down here it would have taken that global context, stuck it into this T, and so whatever that T is defined as, this uh, table version struct, that was the thing with the empty array at the end of it. So there we would have taken the T entry and stuck it into the global context table and the T data and stuck it into the global context table. But if we fall down this error path, we never update these values right here. And this is where the mental juggling comes in because if we look at all the references to this context table, we'll see that inside of this ZR hung get config, which is callable from the uh, get config that uh, was specified in the hints. So this hung config k ioctl get config really mostly is just a wrapper around hung get 
uh, ZR hung get config. And so that calls into this. And so inside of here, there are actually a whole bunch of references to context stuff, most importantly, the data. So we go down here, uh, we can see that it's, you know, checking for is it null. And this again is some good paranoid programming right here. This is just a whole bunch of sanity checks. So that's super appropriate. But eventually, if it bypasses all those sanity checks, it gets to this line, the string n copy, which of course is one of our dangerous functions that we're always super suspicious if we see something like that because there's buffer overflow potential. Well, in this case, we're not worried about a buffer overflow. We're worried about the fact that that data never actually got updated. And we know that if it had gotten updated, that data comes from T, T comes from user table. And so that data entry is that thing that is right after this data structure. So at this point, if we had aired out right here, essentially, the even though the user table field of context had gotten updated, because the data never did, that will still be pointing after this thing that just got freed. And so it's basically a dangling pointer uh, to something, to data after a data structure that already has been freed. And consequently, any use of this is going to be a use after free. And indeed, it is used specifically for a string and copy. And so that means basically this is going to be pulling data out of what is now reclaimed memory from the heap. And so we don't know exactly what data is going to be there, but however the memory allocator chooses to uh, reallocate this address after it's been freed, later on if you come along and just call get config, you're going to be reading out of that location. And it's just going to continue to read out of that location as the memory gets reused and reused and reused until, you know, Ultimately, if the attacker did another set and allowed it to succeed and then did a set and allowed it to error out, they could essentially just cycle through uh, different memory locations reading data with a string and copy. Now, of course, that's not the best primitive in the world. It's not like a mem copy primitive because string and copy doesn't like non ASCII characters and stuff like that. But still, it is definitely an information disclosure. And, you know, there's all sorts of secrets in kernel memory that take the form of strings that you would not necessarily want disclosed. Okay, so that was the bug. What was the fix? Well, this is unknown. So the open source versions of the code that I downloaded, I looked through a few of them and I couldn't find a version that had a fix. Like, so the specific version that I had you download was for a specific model that was called out as being vulnerable. These were like the, the mate 30 and 40. And uh, for those things, I just downloaded what was on their website and that was the vulnerable thing. So obviously they didn't uh, update the source code available on their website to have the patch. I also downloaded the what looked like the latest release of something on their open source website, and that was this Mate X2, and that didn't seem to have any fix in it as well. So all we know is the original advisory said, Huawei OTA images released after April 2022 contain the fix for the vulnerability. But of course, there's always the question of, you know, did the researcher actually go verify that or did they just report what Huawei said to them? So if anyone wants to go out and figure out what the actual fix was, either via uh, finding the source code that I didn't find in my couple of minutes of looking or via doing some reverse engineering of fixes that occurred in April 2022, feel free to let me know what happened there. One final aside is just that I accidentally downloaded a earlier Mate 20 version, which wasn't one of the affected. They said that was 30 and 40 that was affected. I accidentally downloaded the 20 source code to start with. And interestingly, I saw that this bug with this particular control flow path didn't actually exist in the 20. It, uh, it basically just, you know, continued on setting these values. Now, of course, you know, the error handling was consequently incorrect. But, uh, but basically, this bug was introduced later on after the fact.